You are listening to Cursed Murphy's podcast. Our guest, singer, songwriter, actress and filmmaker, Maria Doyle Kennedy. Maria Doyle Kennedy's albums include Charm, Mutter, Sing and her most recent eponymous release, as well as being a gifted interpreter of other artists' material and a former member of Hot House Flowers and the Black Velvet Band. She's an acclaimed actress, best known for her roles in Orphan Black, Dexter, Downton Abbey, The Commitments, Queer as Folk, Sing Street, The General, Outlander, and many other film and television productions. She's also most recently become a director in her own right, having completed the short films A Different Kind of Day in Colour Code. This episode was produced with the support of Wexford Arts Department, Wexford County Council and Wexford Public Library and was recorded in front of a live audience by Dan Comerford. Marie Doyle Kennedy, welcome to Cursed Murphy's podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. How lovely to be here. How much of your life have you spent talking yourself out of doing things? <laughs> um... Very little, really. I, t- I tend to do a lot of things. Um, I don't talk myself out of doing things enough, maybe. Uh, or certainly recently that, that happened. But, um, I, I, yeah, I do have ideas all the time. Is that what you mean? That I do... I'm currently designing in my mind a light installation that, uh, that, um, that involves a light installation, light and sound installation. And that's something that uh, we've never done before. But Kieran and I went to see a piece in um, America, in LACMA, a, a gallery in, in Los Angeles. And it was so inspiring. Beautiful, beautiful washes of light. It was by James Terrell. And uh, we both said afterwards, if we, could, if we lived there, um, we would have gone every morning. I would have gone there every... And you could only be in it for eight minutes. It was a particular... A particular time, they used a lot of ultraviolet light, so I think the theory was that too much of it was maybe not good for your eyes, or maybe you would stop seeing the effect if you were there too long. I'm not Did he do sure. those earth sculptures down in Lissard? That's right, yeah, the sky garden, where you lie on a plinth and, yeah. it's, and it's, the sky is kind of framed through this oval. Um, yeah, he, again, there's a man who does lots of different things. Well, this was a light installation, and it was so uplifting, and I mean, light... It is uplifting though, isn't it? It's why obviously we respond to the sun or we find the winter a bit harder or these were these beautiful warm colours and we felt that the one thing that would change it or even um, enhance it for us would have been the addition of a soundtrack. So we decided to try and design one that has, yeah, that so you feel colour but also you get to listen to music, sounds and then maybe sometimes when it's on there might be live performance that would that would be another thing yeah yeah I'd, all i remember of the the one the one that i experienced was this sort of like white noise like you were about to fall off the edge of the earth or something you know when you're looking at the when you're looking at the i think it was some sort of plant that you lay down on and looked up at that's the, sky. the one in lissard the sky garden you remind yeah, me yeah. of when you're a kid and you climb up onto the roof like and you're yeah there. it's exactly like that and you're giving yourself yeah. vertigo it's like a very primitive drug hit at the age of eight or whatever right <laughs> I used to jump off roofs when I was about eight. I, that was my kind of adrenaline thing. We used to climb up onto flat roofs of, yeah, the school and things and jump off. I, when they make your biopic, you know, that'll be like the metaphor that begins the movie or whatever. Really? The, the reason I ask about the talking oneself out of things is that, like, your life has been demarcated by, you know, incarnations. Like, every... It's like some sort of Buddhist cycle. Every seven or eight <laughs> years, you're sort of remade as... You know, you were a singer, first of all. And so then you're a songwriter after maybe eight or ten years. And then you are uh, became... You were always acting, but then you became renowned as an actor. And then now you're a filmmaker. So there's a constant process of, you know different stuff maybe you get more confidence to kind of do the things that you're thinking of in your head as you get older that might be some of it I, certainly I wouldn't have thought 20 years ago that I would have started making films myself but then 
I just had this one particular story I wanted to tell, which was for the first film, A Different Kind of Day. Yeah. And just wanted to tell it so much that I said, why don't I just, why don't I do it myself? Why don't I write it? And why don't I try and get the money together and film it? And, and um, it was such an enjoyable process to tell the story from the very beginning to the end and have all the... It's what, like a five-minute movie? Describe yeah. for, the, for the listeners what, what the movie's about. Well, the film um, is called A Different Kind of Day and it follows a, a, a sort of a typical Saturday, teenage Saturday afternoon where two young teenagers are just kind of hanging out. You do, you know, just walking and talking and grabbing a coffee, going to a bookshop. Um, but the two young teenagers in question happen to have Down syndrome and they meet another group of teenagers who are also just hanging out a little bit bored and they have an interaction that's a little bit unsettling for them. They're not, um, they're not beaten up or, or anything like that, but they're sort of they're teased and it becomes uncomfortable. And um, they they turn the day around on its head at the end of the film. I won't tell you exactly what happens because it's spoiler, but watch it. It's it's really lovely. It's on our website. Or, but um, I'll get all your emails afterwards and just email it to you. But and, uh, the boy in the film is played by whom? The, the young man is my son, mm-hmm. um, and then the young woman is his friend, uh, Orla, Daniel and Orla. But it was just the idea that um, so many people have preconceived ideas about, about everybody, about everything. I mean, I guess we're, we're built to make judgments. Uh, I presume we developed that ability in order to keep ourselves safe, that you try and figure out who was on your side or who might be against you, who is dangerous or who might be helpful. But I often feel um, that people have a lot of preconceived ideas about Daniel and his friends and what they might not be able to do um, as they have an intellectual disability. But there's so much stuff that Daniel does and understands uh, in a better way than me and I just wanted to make the film to, to make people sort of challenge their perception. Da- Daniel has Down syndrome. It's not that Daniel is Down syndrome. It's a one small facet of a fairly enormous personality. <laughs> is there any difference directing Daniel than there is anyone else? As, a, as your son? He, I did. I mean, I think that there is a thing with your family, and particularly with, with your children, where... Usually you're sort of onto them about a lot of things, aren't you? Especially young, you know, the young boys or the young men. So there is a, a sort of a sense sometimes when I'm speaking to him or giving him an instruction or asking him to do something, I sometimes can sort of see the eyes glaze over <laughs> and he's just like, talk to the hand, you know, because I've just been maing my head off all day at him. So I did know that that would come into play filming, so I... Um, I made really sure to know exactly what I was doing because I knew that I couldn't ask him to do things again and again and again. He'd be just like, I did that already. Mm-hmm. You know, we got that. What, like, I was great. What's the problem with you? So I just I, I planned a really clear shot list uh, and sequence of what we were doing and also made the days very short because... Um, all the bells are lovely, aren't they? Mm. I hope we'll hear them through the thing. Sound Unfortunately, gorgeous. we will. Oh, no, I think it's <laughs> I think it's beautiful addition. Um, yeah, made the days short, but actually all of our crew members... Uh, I just was worried that his focus wouldn't last for longer than a sort of an eight-hour day. There was no point stringing it out into 12, which is often would be a shooting day. Um, but all the crew were really glad that we were just doing that length of a time of a day. And in fact... I think sometimes going for too long, people say we get all these extra scenes in. I think it's a law of diminishing returns. Sometimes mm. people are tired and maybe they don't do their best work in those extra couple of hours. So having it uh, more like a have a proper day and you still have a proper life and then you're glad to come to work the next day and you give it your all. I think even making a feature, I would try and maybe keep that sensibility as, as part of the schedule. Did you learn anything as... An actor after directing? Oh, I really did, yeah. And particularly um, particularly watching Daniel and Orla, I 
they just were so themselves. They, they, they. It was so clear that they weren't acting. I mean, they could, they were pretending to be other people, and there were actions that they had to do that weren't their own natural instinct. But they were just like, yeah, yeah, we, we got this. And they so inhabited the. They're so compelling. It was. It was really brilliant. It made me think about artifice in work and about pretending and about the idea of trying to feel thoughts instead of thinking feelings. Yeah, does that make sense? It reminds me of something Gabriel Byrne once said that the camera has the ability to photograph thought. Yeah, that's and exactly what it's like. That's probably very particular to him and no one else, and that he's so still and, you know, is apparently doing nothing half the time. But, but, but you, it's kind of compelling. You, yeah, it's amazing. You really can see uh, into people's thought processes. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It was a, yeah, it was a real... It was a revelation, and I, I definitely would like to do more. The colour code is a very different kind of film it's a uh, it's soundtracked uh, by a song off your most recent record yeah uh, which is very much to do with what well we were living in Canada at the time that Sandra Bland died and I heard about her death and it just kind of broke my heart really and her family started a campaign on Twitter called Say Her Name, to try and keep her case in the foreground of people's thoughts and discussions so that it wouldn't be forgotten. So Sandra Bland was a young black woman. She was arrested for some driving, I'm not even sure actually of the offence, was it failing to signal a turn or maybe, yeah, I think it was maybe failing to signal a lane change or something like that. She was arrested very aggressively and then she died in jail very shortly afterwards. She was a young opinionated law student. She was just wondering why she had been stopped and it catastrophically escalated into a really physical and uh, dreadful situation for her and um, a limitation of her liberty. Mm. And the dash cam footage has since been released, only, only very recently. And I mean, I, I when I saw that, I, I, I yeah, I really couldn't believe it. But I... I the mayor of New York came out at the time and he spoke and his child is, is biracial and he spoke about the fact how he would talk to him when he was going out um, with his friends to a bar or after college or something and he said, you know, if something kicks off in that bar, if there's any incident anywhere, you know that you cannot behave the way your white friends behave because the outcome will be much different for them than mm -hmm. for you. And I couldn't believe when I heard that something so stark, it, it made me, I thought I was thinking about colour and, and race and gender and how the world perceives you depending on the colour of your skin. But that really, I just imagined, again, back to my own family and my own children like you, you worry about your kids when they're going out and they're, you know, they start drinking and they're going hanging out with their friends and to have this extra awareness that you'd have to build into them from such a young age it was just so starkly unfair I started to read up about um, Sandra Bland and then suddenly found myself in this list of unarmed black men and women who had been killed by the police or in police custody in 2014 and uh, in, in a six month period and it wasn't even an exhaustive list that I've included in the song mm -hmm. but it was again just completely shocking to me to really see the extent and the um, frequency with which it occurred there is a colour code the film is interesting in that it's actually very beautiful and uh, sort of incorporates movement dance mime religious iconography um Michelangelo yeah it, you know there's it's it's actually it's strange in that it manages to be sort of somber but a gorgeous thing to look at at the same time well I wanted people to see it so I felt I would I needed to make it beautiful yeah I, I wanted to make it beautiful so that 
the most amount of people would want to watch it and listen to it. So they would see that, but then they would also hear what it was about, Sandra Bland and all of these other people and the idea of a colour code. What's your first memory of being moved by a voice or a song? Billie Holiday is the first time that I... Um, I mean, I listened to the radio all the time and annoyed my family constantly. I always, there was something, you know, an earworm and I would be just singing and they'd be just like, oh God, would she ever shut up? But, uh... This is what the golden age of disco, yeah, Radio Luxembourg, yeah, middle age yeah, 70s. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, and anything that I heard, I repeated until I found something new, you know, some other new hit. But I got a Billie Holiday record as a present. I think I was 13, 13 or 14, 13, I think. And um, that was the first time that I understood that it was, singing was not just entertainment. It wasn't just pop. It wasn't just, you know, which is, like, pop is great. It has it has a great, you know, job that it does in, in entertaining or making you laugh or <coughs> making you dance or... Um, but this was a different, she sings about pain and sorrow and losing your mind or being on close to that or being on the edge of that or something really, it was, and maybe, and I guess it was, it's certainly her voice and also the time that I heard it. You know, I was, I was growing up, I was maturing a little bit and I had a, uh, I had feelings that I didn't have words for myself, mm. that I that I felt and understood but couldn't express, didn't have the language for, and she had the language for it of it. It was it was an incredible experience. She still, I mean, uh, I I love her singing so much, such a beautiful. I'd love to have heard her sing. She's the one person I think I would really have loved to have been able to be in front of her and hear her sing and watch her sing yeah this is what when you were back up in Bray I was yeah I was living in Bray when I got that album so you yeah. grew up in Clontarf I was born in Clontarf you were born in Clontarf I don't really remember that because I was so small and then we moved to Enniscorthy up the Yellow Bellies um, we moved to Enniscorthy when I was just before I was four and that's where my dad is from was from and uh, a lot of my cousins still live there. And uh, well, Doyle would be a fairly common enough name in Wexford, wouldn't it? Yeah, you were around the corner from us. We, uh, we were on Friary Hill. You were yeah. on... Uh, Church Street. Church Street. Lower Church Street, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, we lived there until I was, mm, I think, eight. And then we went back up to Dublin. You said something in a tweet today before you came down <clears throat> about Wexford. And I thought it was interesting. You said that it that kind of haunts you. Yeah, I have I have a sort of slightly complicated not not relationship, but more feelings about Wexford. I really, I love my cousins. They're great crack, and I had a magical granny, my father's mother, Baby Doyle. She was really really wonderful, wonderful woman, and um, loved her grandchildren. You know, played with us, indulged us gave us loads of sweets, would correct her grammar. Um, she taught us loads of things, she was wonderful. Taught us all how to play cards when we were like, she taught us all to play poker when we were about six. She loved to play cards, so she was obviously just wanted more people to play with. Um, but also, there's kind of a, there's a darkness. I feel there's some big magnetic pull under the earth in Wexford. I don't know what it is, but I feel it. It's strange. I think also there was, I had a cousin who drowned in, 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 Enesco, in, in the Slaney. And I think I feel that as well, the pull of that river. It's so, it's dark and it's cold and I feel it. I think that's got something to do with it as well, for sure. I can't imagine what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, isn't it? It's, it is like a big, huge magnet. Yeah. Then there was a sequence of, I suppose, time speeds up. You start singing with Hot House Flowers. 
You meet Kieran Kennedy. You form the Black Velvet Band. Um, they start casting for the commitments. It's like an incredibly compressed five or six years. And I suppose the first question to do with that is, what do you learn? What do you learn about yourself or about being in a band? Did that teach you what it means to lead a band, to record, to... I just wonder what the path was that led you to actually then writing your own songs and, and, and formulating your own kind of musical vision. I think I was late to do all that. Most people, um, most people form bands or start all that process when they're in school. Mm. And for some reason, they're just, I didn't meet people when I was in school that were also, and I didn't play an instrument. I play a little bit of piano, enough to sort of work out melodies sometimes if I'm writing songs or writing melodies, but I don't play in any way proficiently. So I was writing things all the time, but just little singing things to myself, and I just didn't meet other people. I went to school in Greystones, at secondary school. I just didn't meet other people who were also playing instruments that we would have sort of naturally formed a band. So I, it was later I was in college when I, when I started doing that, and so I, I just kind of fell into that, and I wanted to sing, and, and uh, it was such a joyful expression to sing. So it took me a long time to then go, oh no, but I really should be writing my own songs. I think most people would have started off those processes at 14 and mm -hmm. then, you know, much sooner be writing their own songs. But it took me really until uh, my 30s to be writing my own songs. And then I decided to start a record label and, st yeah, start the whole kind of thing then. It took me a while. I didn't lead a band. But, like, I didn't, you know, the Black Velvet Band was really, was Kieran's, um, can I tell them the story, Kieran? About? Of course. Kieran's here. I don't know what the story is, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, well, Kieran wanted to ask me out, and he knew that if he asked me out, he wasn't entirely sure that I'd say yes, so he invented a band <laughs> and said, I have this band and we're making a demo, and I would like you to sing in it. And so I said, OK, well, you know, send me the music and I'll see if I like it or if I feel I'd have anything to offer, you know, if I felt I could sing in it. And anyway, he did. I responded. We went for a date. And then suddenly he went, oh, shit, I have to actually get this band together now. So he convinced somebody to um, give him some money uh, to get a studio. And he got some friends together that he had been playing with in different forms or new in different forms. And I came in and we recorded this demo. And then that did go on to attract the attention of a record label and we got signed and everything. But he only told me literally 10 years after we were married <laughs> that that band didn't exist and was just a, a way to ask me out. So, I mean, it's a pretty romantic story, I think. And we had a lot of experience and fun as a band. Bands form for worse reasons. Indeed. <laughs> Was there a click that made you write songs? I think um, I think I was a mother to my two eldest boys by then, and I just suddenly realised that it was possible. I, I guess I got, I became confident as well, or, or maybe I started to care less about judgment. I was so in awe of songwriters always and of the ability that they had to do it and to sit down with a guitar and come up with some beautiful melody and words and I, I was in awe of it for a really long time and then eventually I was just like, well if you want to do it, why don't you begin? And I just, yeah, I, I guess I just cared less about judgement and more about trying to do something that I had inside me that was trying to come out. Mm -hmm. And before it I think I would have been too um, fearful of the judgment and, and, and myself would have judged everything in harsh terms and not favourably to the songwriters that I that I loved but it's a muscle and you have to start to use it and then you get better, you learn something about it, something about what works and what doesn't and, and different ways to ex tell a story and, and yeah, I guess you get better or you give up. You were doing I mean you were for, for you know, for starving artists, you were pretty choosy about 
<laughs> about roles, about film and TV roles. And you didn't do a lot of theatre comparatively. Yeah. But then I listen to, like, you think of something like Helena off the first album, off Charm, and you think about, well, the narrative sense, and it's almost like a Lorca play, and you're kind of inhabiting a character. And I'm wondering, even at that point, how much of a bleed over there was, or, you know, you're not like Brechtian or anything in your performance, but there's an element sometimes of, like, who, you know, who's the character behind this song? I think that everything you do becomes part of what you make. Um, again, Patrick Scott. I think really taught me that by his example. His whole life was his art. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he he's famous for his paintings, obviously beautiful, beautiful paintings. But he did all kinds of other things as well. He designed things and he made oh I don't know. He designed the old train. Remember the trains that used to be black with the orange thing. He designed that years and years ago in the seventies, I guess, or whatever. But he thought of everything that you did and. And it's definitely true. Like, and every gathering that you have, every meal you have with people, every time you're either kind or cruel, or everything that impacts on you, every um, injury or every opportunity, they all make up what you are and how you see things, and how then you will retell them or make them. So, I definitely think, I think that acting has made my live shows, my gigs kind of more theatrical mm -hmm. and I think that singing and writing songs has made me really think about a character when I'm acting I really think about not just the words that I get on the page but who are they what do they how do they feel what do they do when they're not on this page how do they open the door what is their favorite music that they want to listen to all those kind of things so they definitely they color each other but as does being a mother uh, you know traveling interested in people that you meet or books that you read or you know it all it all goes in doesn't it and, and makes what what comes out I love that Tom Waits quote he says the way anything is the way you do everything yeah yeah that's exactly then Dad, there's the other one where Al, 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 Al Pacino says I start with the shoes <laughs> he talks about a character I start with the shoes a lot of a lot of actors do that a lot of theatre actors in particular because um, they they say that the way you walk, whatever kind of shoes you have on, influences the way that you walk and the way that you carry your body. And that obviously is a huge part of who somebody is, mm -hmm. how, they, how they sit, how they stand, how they, how they go from A to B. So a lot of actors do that, yeah, particularly in the theater. I haven't done uh, so much theatre because I always had, um, g gigs are always lined up quite a lot in advance. They would, you know, you'd have gigs booked in for six months or a year possibly. And so when asked to do a play, there'd always be these odd dates that I couldn't do. And it's not like you can sort of take a night off uh, when you're doing a play. Whereas if you're doing a film, you can say, I've got these few different things and they can agree to not have you filming those days. So that's kind of how that worked out. But you, I also feel I get the live experience through gigs, so I don't I don't feel that I'm You used to be it. terrified before gigs. I'm not great still. <laughs> what I mean, how the hell did you get through a play ever? Because it seems like the intensity is ramped up even more. I think it's just the same. It's just this terrible fear just before you begin. And then Within a gig, I I do two songs and then I, I, I've i land during those two songs and then I know where I am and I, I'm good. But I can never speak to the audience until I've two songs down and never can never say hello after the first song where you have to just get through two and then I'm there and then I'm, we're bonded and then it's, it's okay. But it's um, I've what, learned to embrace it. What is the bit. fear of? I don't know. I mean, I guess it's just a... What is it a fear of? Is it a fear that you'll fail somehow that you'll fall that you'll reveal too much or I don't I don't really know what the fear is but it's I've come to kind of just accept it it's not that I like it it's a it, I mean it's a feeling of sort of um panic which isn't a nice feeling ever but I've come to sort of accept that it's part of what gets me on stage I, I suppose what it is in sort of physiological 
terms is that you get your adrenaline up so that you're you, you're sort of able for it or you you're, you take it on you know and um, and I guess it's just that sort of yeah it's not great but then you have it and you're armed and you're <laughs> you're you're set it's a strange compulsion to like I know put oneself why through do we put the ourselves sort of through it again and abject again terror and, again. and then spend the, the next day being relieved that it's over but I do love I love 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 Gigging. I really, I really love it. So it's 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 worth feeling a bit uncomfortable for a while. That idea that you're in a room for two hours with people and you're all connected. You know, you're all getting it. You're all like plugged in to the same. Just it's human connection. Yeah, it's. I just think it's so powerful. It gives me energy. There's a sound of a room that's listening. I think. It's like a sucking kind of feeling. Is it like the sound now? Uh, yeah, it's really, it's really uh, uh, unnerving. Uh, that is, that is interesting. T- tell me about your um, approach as an interpretive singer, because you've you began uh, singing in bands uh, with people who'd written the songs, but you've continued to make records where you sing if not standards I mean you did uh, uh, one record of essentially in pre-war 1920s 30s and 40s almost Carter family yeah. standard stuff from the anthology of American folk music all those weird strange um, yeah they're kind incredible of mythical aren't they? songs from, from before the war and then, and then you did Skull Cover which was a record of almost kind of modern day standard songs by The Cure or whomever um, yeah, Perry Como is on that too. Is there, um, what do you look for in a song? Um, I guess uh, there's two things really. One, what, some songs are just such beautiful stories. They just, they just paint um, John Prine's Angel from Montgomery is a perfect example of that. What a beautiful song. You're in the kitchen with those people when you listen to his words you you start worrying about them you want their life to be better you're hoping for that a, just a break will break for them you, you you want it so badly you yearn for them when you hear the story that's a beautiful thing to hear and then also they're just notes sometimes there's melodies that just again are kind of bewitching they're kind of compelling and they and they pull you towards it and I don't know whether they offer comfort or maybe provocation sometimes, but they, they're like something that you, you need. I think now we, we found this, well, anything now about the music really is not just me, it's Kieran and I, because it's always his playing and my singing. And we found a way now of sort of taking any song that we like of, of somebody else's and playing it in a way that we like to play it. It's a kind of a... It's, a, it's a kind of a, yeah, it's a great thing to have. Yeah, the, the, I always think the second record that you made with Kieran Mutter um, was, it's like a forest, that record. I mean, it took a, quite a while to figure out what the sound well, scape Well, y- you would be. personally were absolutely essential in the record being made. Uh, I mean, for those listening, I was making an album and I just got a little bit lost when I was doing it. Sometimes you have a song and if you've written it yourself, there's like, there's five ways it could end up and five versions of it and five different kinds of music you could put on it. And I, I, I couldn't, and they were all interesting and good in different ways from each other and I just couldn't figure out where to go or how to finish it or how to get through it. And Peter... Murphy came up to me at the end of a gig and he handed me a book and he said I have just read your album and the book uh, was by Chuck Palahniuk and it's called Diary and I read I was so grateful and I read it and I totally understood what you meant and it became a map for that very dense album that yeah it is true there's such a thing as a difficult second album but um, I got through it yeah I completely forgot about that. It's such a twisted book as well. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. <laughs> well, you literally heard the gig and then you're like, no, I know. I've just, I've read your album. It was, it was enormously helpful. Thank there, you. There's, uh, there, 
and there was interesting stuff happening around that time. It was like you were starting to become almost without trying more kind of globally recognized as an actor. Um, so he'd sort of, there were all these stuff like Dexter and the Tudors and, but something seemed to happen. There was a click where the, the dislocation came together with something like Orphan Black, where I don't think it's any accident that you actually sang in, in that show because it was very different. It was the only kind of vaguely speculative or sci-fi kind of work that you'd done. Um, and there was something about the sensibility of it seemed to suit your songwriting sensibility more than anything else. That's true, and also it became... Um, it was a vehicle for us to move, and we're, we're kind of gypsies, Kieran and I, and we like to move every so often and have an adventure and experience a new culture a new place to be and um, it was filmed in Canada in Toronto and for the first while I would just sort of fly over and back um, and they would very kindly try and kind of push all my days together so I would go over for 10 days and be home for two or three weeks and then go back again for a week or 10 days but the part got a little bit bigger I started having to go a bit more and then I started just feeling like I was being rubbish everywhere that I would arrive over there and then try to turn myself around in the time and then do the work and then come home and then be jet lagged and try and turn myself around again to get into my home and um, so then Kieran said why don't we move there um, so we went uh, with the kids for like six months of each year for the next few years five six it years. took five years the whole show there were five seasons so we'd go and it was brilliant and the children went to school there and then they'd come back and go to school here and everybody had a huge experience and, and made friends and learned things about a different country and, and uh, city and culture and it, it was really amazing and definitely that sparked a whole new um, ease or something with songwriting and we started to perform over there as well. We started to gig all the time and it all became just very rich. We met Mary Margaret O'Hara and Leslie Feist and Ron Sexsmith, all these uh, Torontonian You ended up being in Leslie Feist's video. I made a video with her, a Sort yeah. of orchestrated dance fight, West Side Story, almost That's right. updated kind of yeah. choreographed fight dance. Yeah, with her and me and Jarvis Cocker. Check out that name I just dropped there, just <laughs> in the floor, yeah. It's a good one to drop. It was fun. She's a beautiful, beautiful singer, and uh, and Mary Margaret as well. What an extraordinary singer, oh my goodness. But uh, yeah, the whole tapestry of that moving and... But the characters, well, Mrs. S in Orphan Black is kind of a badass. She's like a sort of frontier. So do you think you're channeling your grandmother? <laughs> Mm, maybe, or some of my Doyle cousins up the road, maybe, they're, they're pretty serious. Yeah, she was a uh, tough piece of work. She was, yeah, and really good with a gun. Uh, it was fun, it was fun to play somebody like that, I had never done it before. Did and you? also, you, you know, you get to do all that stuff and you don't have to deal with the real life consequences of your actions. Do you get, like, arms training? Yeah, oh yeah, loads of it, yeah. I'm pretty good now. <laughs> I enjoyed uh, that show hugely as well because of the the young woman who whose stepmother I played. Her name is Tatiana Maslany, and she played several different characters. Ten or eleven by the end, maybe the show was about this girl who discovers she's a clone, and there are lots of other versions of her in the world. And they start trying to meet up, and she was just um, just an absolute genius. I mean. She's 20 years younger than me. I learned so much from being around her and watching her work. It was really like a, just a master class in, in acting. And I never did, I didn't ever go to drama school, so everything I've learned is from watching other people. So I really, I watch and listen very actively. Um, in, oh, well, in, I think mostly in life, unless I'm a small bit drunk. 
but um, in, in work in particular. And I, that was a great experience to work alongside her. What do you require from a director? Well, it's um, sometimes you don't quite understand things. They're they're not the words are there, and you understand what the words mean, but you're just kind of wondering what the intention is behind that. And sometimes somebody can really help with that. Uh, I think what a director has to do is just allow you to do your best. That so they have to create an atmosphere where you feel comfortable and you might take the odd risk because that usually leads to something exciting. But again, it might fail. So you have to not be know that you're not going to get punished for, you know, for trying, for taking a chance on something. Um, yeah, it's always it's always exciting to to work with people who are smart and have a little bit of an, an insight into something. You know, it's it's yeah, it's great. You learn every time and and get better. I think. Do you have a favorite role that you played? I mean, I think probably my, my favourite thing, just because it's so, it's the only thing my family have ever um, been interested in. Like, normally they just want to know, like, what's for tea? But they were very proud of me that I was in one episode of Father Ted, because <laughs> that's really big in our house. Um, and I still, I mean, we all love Father Ted still. So that's kind of, I'm really glad that I was, that I was part of that. <laughs> What song are you proudest of? I think... Uh, well, Yes, We Will it was kind of a really important song for us um, because we... Well, that's an interesting story. You yeah. mentioned John Prine earlier. Yeah, we got. he's a huge hero of my... Like, I just think he's an extraordinary songwriter and... We wrote that song, and I heard his voice in my head. And um, I hadn't even been listening to him particularly that day or that week or anything. And we found a way to send him the song. And then he called me one day and said, I love that song, I'd love to record it with you. And that was just, again, it was just one of those little things where you need some encouragement or a little bit of luck or something to go your way to, to make you just want to go forward or, or even just make you want to hang on sometimes. But um, it was so amazing that he... I still don't really know why... Well, it's a lovely... It's a beautiful song, but uh, it was just so wonderful of him <coughs> to do that. Well, you mentioned that about that song. Um, go find it if you haven't heard it. Um, you said there's not many songs about... You said there's loads of songs about falling in love, but very few about staying in love. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think that probably what appealed to him was the sense of a character who's had a few licks of paint taken off the chassis. Um, but it's forging away ahead but it's all the yeah. same. Yeah, still, still, yeah. I think that's true. There's... there's falling in love is exciting, isn't it? And... In, First things are always exciting. Initial sparks are kind of, you know, there's a there's a fire and a combustion and something attractive to to write about. And then the staying sometimes is overlooked, isn't it? Or or the the idea of the journey or or how how much it will take to stay in it or on it. Um, and it's I mean, I've been married a really long time. I'm really I'm really feel really lucky that I um, that I am and that I still want to be and that uh, that Kieran still wants to be and uh, <laughs> <laughs> how much of that is that your lives are intertwined creatively as well as personally and with family in every other way you know Kieran's an interpreter a producer a soundscaper yeah. an editor I would imagine I think it's certainly I think it's been incredibly helpful to us as a partners in life as a couple that we make music together I mean there certainly have been times that we would have had a, had a row and then have a gig to do later on and we would find ourselves on stage and then we're in a song and we look at each other and the row is gone because we were just connecting in a much 
a deeper level through music without words and it's been very um it's been yeah incredible to be able to share it and f for me to write songs as somebody who doesn't play an instrument well or you know barely at all to be able to um create songs with somebody who is kind of a genius on the any i mean he'd get a tune out of that wire if you left him alone for 10 minutes but to be able to de describe how, what I think about the song or the melody in references that we have you know over 30 years of shared reference so I can describe a, a film or a day that we spent together or a place we were or a colour and he knows what I mean because I can't say that goes from F sharp minor to blah blah I don't have that language but I have the, our shared world and that's and he understands those references and can help me make a song and it's it's brilliant yeah very lucky well finally um what's left undone loads <laughs> um well we've just started making a new album so that will be another quest to find the heart and truth of that and and and, and get it made but um, it's exciting too and um, yeah, I think that's, I'm just going to, I need to just put my eyes on that for the moment. So that's what I'll think of right now. I think we'll make loads more tunes. I think we'll play loads more gigs and hopefully keep traveling because that's just keeps us, feeds us, you know. And yeah, keep, keep, stay curious, keep, keep going. Maria Doyle Kennedy, thank you for being on Cursed Murphy's podcast. Oh, thank you.